Thank you. Thank you. I just see that this, um, it's loud enough for everybody. Excellent. I understand that most of you have hangovers this morning, so I won't be too gentle or else you'll um, fall asleep. Um, so Paul will be joining us later on. Paul is my web developer and he had to work, um, work with me and nurse me through the, um, the rebirthing of my WordPress site recently, so happily. Um, but I've got him here in case you've got um, questions for really, really smart people that, um, that he can help with. Um, but he'll take over for a little bit later, but you can feel free to Yeah, I'll, I'll sit down, but really I'm here to take on at the end, so um, we're more in speech. Cool. Um, I was a teeny bit nervy this morning getting ready for this, and my husband said, but you do heaps of public speaking. What's the, what's the difference here? And, um, and I said, yeah, but usually when I talk, it's about fundraising, which I know so well, and I'm talking to a room full of volunteers, and volunteers are always awesome people. He said, oh, what, so you're talking to a room full of assholes today? <laughs> I said, yeah, probably not. You all look all right. Um, but basically, I'm putting myself up as a use case of WordPress. I'm an avid WordPress lover, um, app lover. Um, I mess around with tools all the time and try and push the boundaries of what they can do for me and my audience. So I'll just take you through a little bit of a journey so you get where I'm at. Um, for people who like structure, here's a little bit of an overview. If you do like structure, you'll probably end up hating me because I'm a creative and I'll get like an idea that comes and bams me on the back of the head and spits out whatever I was saying and takes over. So um, just, just bear with me, it's all good. So who the hell am I? Um, basically all the background. I do like to have a bit of a funnel rant. Um, I'm a little bit anti-funnel but we'll, uh, we'll get there. And then I'll take you through, I've got five tools that I'm gonna showcase that I use on my site. Um, so a bit of who I am. We'll start with the problem that, um, that I came across uh, back in 2005, when I was, I guess, looking to start the business. So the problem was that school and, fu school and club fundraising organizers, um, who are the PNC committee, the PNF committees, even like the guides organizing this, um, the volunteers organising this conference, um, fate organisers, kindy organisers, there was a high turnover of them. They received no training, they were all time poor volunteers and they had to reinvent the wheel all of the time. Um, not only that, they didn't really have ready access to um, information about the suppliers who could help them. So what we have created in the time from then until now is a comprehensive supplier directory um, a massive library of resources, and we've built an amazing community of school and club volunteers. A little bit of how I came to be the fundraising whisperer. Um, I was a lawyer, I call myself a recovering lawyer. Um, and then once, I went back to work part-time after having children, and when I had my third, it was just a little bit hard. So I stopped working. Um, my stepfather was distributing a laundry detergent, which was environmentally friendly and worked on a refill system. I came up with a genius idea that it would make an amazing fundraiser. Schools could get ongoing revenue and all of that. And so I threw myself at this project, as I do with everything, and um, researched the crap out of school and club fundraising in Australia. Uh, and there was really nothing that did a great job of connecting the suppliers with the volunteers. Um, and plus there was this whole reinvent the wheel issue. Um, that business, the laundry detergent business, failed dismally. It was um, a bit of a disaster, it just didn't work. Um, but as Walt Disney said, failure is only failure if you don't learn from it. Um, and so that, through that process, of course, I get to see this huge gap in the market. And I meet this lady, Helen Creswick, who is here with me um, to the right of me. Um, she had a hobby fundraising website. And we caught up, had coffee, and we were soulmates from the start. And both of us in the same breath um, described what was needed by the industry. So, you know, we need a publication that is sent free to the committees. We need a website that has a lot of resources. We need to build a community where everyone supports each other. And we say, wouldn't it be great if they did that? You know, they. And it genuinely never occurred to us that we would actually do it. And so, you know, we went away, and it was about probably a week or so later, that I literally, I don't know what I was in the middle of doing, but I stop. And I sort of had this 
literally this light bulb moment. And I go, well, they is we. And I'd only met her once. <laughs> I'd only met her once. And I phoned her up. I go, Helen, Helen, we could do it. She's going, yeah, we could do it. And we're both sort of running around crazy. And the next week we put in $500 each to start this thing. So we start the fundraising directory. Um, and it was a success from the start and we had an absolute ball. Um, the sad part of the story is that Helen passed away in 2008. About a month ago, it was 10 years. Um, and so obviously that was awful. Um, and I probably took six months just not doing anything, just recovering. But particularly in honour of her, she really wanted it to grow into um, really the Bible of fundraising, and it has. So she would be tickle pink. So we have a print publication. I have a question mark over whether that's a dinosaur. It certainly has gotten smaller over the years. Um, we're putting our 13th publication together for next year, and we do send it out free to volunteers out there. Um, on the cover is my youngest child. I'm too cheap to pay for models, so I just make my own. <laughs> the, um, the downside of that is I've ended up with five children, so <laughs> I took that a little bit far. Um, but it's a, it's a cool one. And then I have this website. This is um, the remodeled website that Paul helped to build, um, it, it's pretty cool. So there's a lot on it. There's a lot of complexities, and Paul will take you through a little bit of what he had to deal with when faced with this project. Um, but I'm really going to take you through sort of the how we've extended it with some extra tools. Now I'm going to see if this bit works. No, right. Um, it has a tweeny bit of a video, but I'll um, press play on it. There we go. Anyway, so I'm just, this is a tiny little demo that I can't really explain um, unless I'm taking you through it. So this is our supply directory, um, and it's just a beautiful interface now. It wasn't before. Um, and you just click on the filters, and it sort of auto-refreshes um, what it displays. So you can really find any kind of fundraising supplier that you're after. It's awesome. And then we've got our free resources. We have heaps of them, and they're all free to download. Um, and so this, is, again, is a beautiful interface. Um, and then you just sign up to become a member and download it. It's all, membership is free too. Um, so it's gorgeous, obviously. Um, so we needed to customize the site quite a bit to be able to um, deliver all of these. These are articles. We have so many articles. We've been around for so long, like, we could post twice a day for a year and still not use up all of our content. Um, so there we go, and I know it's going to move on to my next slide now. Okay, now Facebook is sort of where it's at for us. A lot of people are on different platforms. Um, but this, I took this screenshot on Thursday. It was 35,095 followers. Today it's 35,287. So it's actually like it's quite a a dynamic growing group, but it's also a really amazing group. Actually, Facebook is where the community that Helen and I dreamed of creating, that's where it's taken place. We thought it was forums. <laughs> we all laugh at forums these days, but um, the Facebook is where it's at, and in particular, our closed Facebook groups. We have about 3,500 members in our closed groups, and um, this is actually now where all of our content creation comes from. Because these guys are all chatting to each other. We've got a fate organizers group. They're all asking questions, and then all these people come straight on and answer them. There's an article for us. How do I run my hot chip stand? 25 responses. And then we just create, curate that, really, into an article. Someone types into Google, how do I run my hot chip stand? Ta-da! There we are. Um, but it's a fantastic um, group for them as well as for us. Um, these are our free resources. I took you through a little bit before. Try to keep a whole range of resources for people to use. Um, fun social media images they can download and share on their committee page. Um, this one is for our suppliers who actually, because we make our money out of advertising in case I didn't make that clear. So our clients include Cadbury, the entertainment book, all the T-Tel fundraising people. Um, so we give this away free for suppliers. Now, before I move into my um, my favourite tools, 
Uh, I'm going to have my little bit of a funnel rant. Um, and I know funnels are helpful, particularly the click funnels, because they do help to organise you and get you thinking about what your core value is, how you communicate it properly, um, and all of that. But what bugs me, and maybe Facebook has flagged me as a gullible idiot, because I just get bombarded with these ads for people selling funnel training, um, and they're the ones sitting on a farm, luxury farm, or sitting in Saint-Tropez sipping pina coladas and going, yeah, you too could automate your whole business and um, not do any work and become rich like me. Well, the reason they become rich is because people believe that they can have their lifestyle. It's almost multi-level marketing. Um, yes, but there we go. There's my, there's my rant. It wasn't too toxic. Okay. Now, the first of my tools is probably the least... WordPressy, um, but I love it. Last year we did, um, in collaboration with QT actually, the Australian Centre for Nonprofit Studies, we did a national fate research project. So we did a big survey of all primary schools in Australia. We got 500 responses out of 7,000 schools, which is um, very good, very difficult to reach. But they said statistically significant, which I interpreted as really, really happy with the results. Um, but we got an awful lot of data out of that. And so I'm turning that, we're just about to launch it actually, um, into a set of resources where people will come in, plug the date of their fate, and then we will send them the resources to count them down to that event. So basically they're getting the information they need at exactly the right time they need it. Three months to go, this is what you need to be thinking of. If you haven't already booked that, book here. And by the way, here's a list of suppliers that can help you. Um, but that's all, and we obviously replicate that through our website. The content is on there, but we also ship it out to them. Um, here's another toy I've been playing with. The upside to being an app addict is that I have some cool stuff on my site that I can engage my audience with. The downside is that I can waste an awful lot of time playing with tools. Um, I have more lifetime deals than I know what to do with. Um, most of them just sit and waste away, um, but there are some that are amazing. Um, I'm an avid follower of AppSumo. Every couple of days I'm going back and seeing what else they've got for my goodie bag. Um, but here's one I bought a couple of weeks ago and I a bit love. So because I can't be on the website all the time, I did have a, chat, a live chat thing on there. But it was pretty annoying. It would come up on my phone. What are the raffle rules? Like everyone wants to know what the raffle rules are. And so I'd point them the right way. So I decided to get in an assistant. The fundraising whisper bot now helps me. So I've got um, this bot, Curio bot. Um, so um, you'll see she's... Um, up there on the left, I've launched her. She's coming and asking what um, we can help with. And she's saying, oh, yeah, yeah, we'd love to let you know what we're all about. Well, how can we help you? We've got a list of the most common um, questions or places we want help with. Um, this one asks, just tell me what you do. And so I've got this lovely graphic that pops up that um, basically takes them through the, the guts of what... It is we do. But if, it, if you were after raffle rules, it'll sort of take you to where they are. If you want all of the common um, questions, it'll find a way. And if we can't answer them, um, it sends a question to us that we can later answer. But also we have the MailChimp sign-up built into it. So we sort of end every conversation with, you know, we send out fun emails every week. Surely you want to get one. You want to sign up to the list. So... Um, so that's pretty neat. This third one is possibly my favourite. I had so much fun doing this. Um, this is a, um, a hybrid. I use um, Typeform, which is a form builder. It doesn't need to be Typeform that you use. Zapier, which I couldn't live without. Um, it does a lot of things for me. So basically, um, the exercise I was after was... Um, creating articles for my clients. So I've got however many advertisers. 
um, as an SEO exercise, um, I want to get links back from them because it's all relevant content and highly valued um, Google juice. Um, so what we're offering in exchange for that is going, well, we'll do a profile, like a behind the scenes, a day in the life of um, you and put it on our site um, as long as you link to it. Um, so the process of doing this, I created a type form. For those of you who don't know type form, it's sort of very much an interactive question answer form builder. Um, and But I've used hidden fields to put in the name and business name of the client. So when they open the form, it's, hey, Toby, um, what's the first thing you do when you get to the picture products office each morning kind of thing? And then, um, and then it's all ready to post, which through the magic of Zapier just happens. Um, so I've got a wee demo of just how quick it takes, how quick it is. And now I've done the work once and there's nothing more to do any time. So there's the link that I send them. They click on the link that has the hidden fields, their details in it. Um, so how do you start your day? Obviously, they would write actual content. I've just put in a couple of words to demonstrate quickly how this works. What's the one thing that happens? Sure to bring a smile to your face. Good reviews. Um, and as soon as they um, submit this document, you'll see what happens. So I go back to my WordPress backend. And it actually would be quicker than this if I hadn't missed the click. But um, it's there as a draft. So, um, yes, press preview, silly. Ta-da! Um, so I'm going to use this also for um, doing like fate profiles, getting fate organizers to come and do a wrap-up of their event. Um, again, it's just zero work for me, content creation, engagement, all of that. I love it. Um, oh, yeah, and then you just obviously edit it. You can actually, if you get them to upload an image, it will create that as the featured image. Um, but I'm a control freak. I want to know what all of that looks like. So I don't have that functionality, but you can. It's pretty cool. Um, here's another app that um, took my fancy and is, is pretty cool. It's Beamer, Get Beamer. Um, it's basically a what's new. Um, and it's a little pop-up that comes from the side. And again, this is a very quick demo of it. Ta-da! You click the what's new. That doesn't just come up automatically because that would be annoying. Um, and that pulls automatically from your WordPress content. As you're posting content, you can turn off the display on Beamer. Um, and then you can go into the Beamer interface, add extra stuff. So I put this little GIF in to say our website was about to be launched. <laughs> yep, it is pretty cool. Um, but that's a lot of fun because then we can also make little announcements. You know, we've got this new advertiser. They've got this offer. It just means we can add extra value to our advertisers in a very simple way. So that's cool. Um, my final tool um, is social be that I've come to rely on. It could be any of those evergreen um, social media um, feeders, aggregators. Um, Meet Edgar, um, Social B, I can't think of the name of other ones, but basically um, you load your content into categories within Social B. Um, you set your calendar. Yes, I want a funny to post on Tuesday morning. I want a case study to post Thursday afternoon. And then it just pulls from your library continually. And it has certain rules. It won't repeat content within three months. Um, um, and it's basically, you, you set it up once and it just feeds it out. It can pull automatically from your new content through WordPress. Um, I don't do it because I have so many categories because I have quite a carefully crafted social media timeline um, that um, when I post something new, I, it's very simple because they have a widget. Um, so basically, you go to your article that you want to post. You click on the, the plug-in, the widget, on the um, toolbar. So it, be, it pops up with this. You ch choose where you want it to post. You choose which category it goes into. You write your little bit of a blurb. 
and then it's in the library and it'll stay there forever. Um, you've probably got to have a fair bit of content existing to be able to get away with doing that. Um, but if once you do and once you put the work in the first time, and it means that I go in and post the fun stuff. So I'll go share current stuff. Um, this is not just what we do. Um, we certainly do have, like, you know, that actual engagement, but I think you still need to get the value out of all of your existing content. Oh, I think I clicked through to an advertiser. And, um, and that's a great way to do it. Uh, I decided to throw in some unsolicited advice, just because I've been in business a very long time. Um, and my first bit of unsolicited advice is not to listen to unsolicited advice, so you can all just sit back and relax. Um, probably the number one thing is a business is only a clever idea um, until someone hands over money. And I say this because I have um, followed my tail many times over the years with little clever side projects um, that have eaten up a lot of my time and money. Um, and these days I stick to my knitting. Um, and um, I think Tim Ferriss talks about it in his um, four-hour workweek book about just getting to that point as quickly as you possibly can, even if you kind of mock up website with a product, you buy it at retail cost or whatever, just to prove there's a demand before you then go and um, service it and create a whole framework to service it. Um, stay fun. I like to um, keep a lot of a lot of that energy in what I do, and I guess it's sort of um, the the field that I work in is for it because certainly volunteers want to have fun. Um, a lot of the problems with the volunteer engagement is because there's not not as much fun in like committee life meetings, blah 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 blah. But um, yeah, but that's a good thing. Persistence overcomes resistance, um, and I think the what I bring to the table with this kind of work is. I'm creative, I'm a problem solver, and um, I'm a dreamer and a doer, so I get stuff done. I actually have this saying, I like to add GSD to everything I do, which is get shit done. Um, but that's my part of the talk. I'm going to bring Paul up here to have a little talk about um, how we came to create a website that needed to service this, um, this audience. Okay, thank you, Mandy. Mm -hmm. So, uh, my name's Paul Dunson, um, and I am uh, really Mandy's overlord when it comes to uh, web design and development. Um, Mandy's an interesting case um, in terms of a client for us, as you probably imagine, but not as unique as you think. Um, mm -hmm. So, talking from agency world, uh, which is where I come from, although we try not to think of ourselves as a traditional agency. Um, we're actually seeing 50% of new business coming through the door of disgruntled customers who've had a previous developer who are trying to change where they're at now and move on uh, to something better. And we're all trying to move forward to something better. Amanda's an interesting case because she's been in business for 12 or 13 years, She's obviously a smart person. She's made, yeah, she, she's made her way and she's finally got the job done with a very successful business. But uh, to change where she's come from doing a similar kind of thing for 12 years, which is unusual, coming through the door, we uh, we had to really, really take a few steps back and really slow down. So in this particular case with Mandy, we actually went through four revisions of the scope of work before we actually did anything. So I know Mandy and I went back and forth and back and forth about money and scope and this and that and timeline and all that sort of thing. But I think if you're in a position where you are changing agencies or developers or even technology, it's really important to, instead of getting excited and jumping in head first, to really slow it up and determine where it is that you see yourself in the next few years, and really look at things from the long-term play. WordPress has, over time, kind of been associated with cutesy little blogs and you know, mum and dad kind of sites, but 
there are some serious projects online that are in WordPress. There are some very big players that use WordPress. And I think the people who really succeed in WordPress are very strategic. And I think that's where Mandy, combined with us, worked well as a particular case study. So in the case of Mandy, we had to do a complete back-end rebuild. Uh, she had a number of third-party custom tools that we really just pretty much had to throw in the bin. Uh, we did a complete migration to Amazon Web Services, um, which is unusual uh, for a lot of people. Uh, you, a lot of people who are used to the WordPress uh, world, they're used to dealing with uh, shared hosts. Um, we actually built a complete environment in, in uh, Amazon uh, with a staging site, which shouldn't be uh, particularly <laughs> unusual for you. If you don't have a, a staging site, please get one. Um, and one of the big areas where we really succeeded with Mandy was regular catch-ups. Um, so what I mean by regular catch-ups is, you know, every few days we check in and we go, okay, so-and-so and the team's working on this particular area. These are the challenges we're having. We need this more information. And I think a web project really runs well when the client takes some time to invest in it. After all, it is their business and... We get, uh, we get a lot of clients through the door, and a lot of them try to completely hand off everything to you. It's like the web developer will solve all my problems, and I'll take no involvement. There's a really good balance between too much client involvement and just enough. As a service provider, we need to find that balance, but I think it's very important if you are running a small business or a large business that you take the time to understand as much as the web developer does, if not more, about what's going on in the project and where you are heading. Because having two heads looking for those problems is always going to be better. So working with Mandy's enthusiasm, our approach. So yes, she's certainly more one of our, uh, one of our more exuberant clients, and yes, largely humoring her. Um, in times of uh, challenge is definitely a strategy. Um, the self-proclaimed app addict. Um, so uh, at OSC, we're very much about uh, website performance and finding that balance. Everybody's talking about uh, mobile access to the web. Um, the majority of our e-commerce e clients are now seeing 60% of access to their sites by a mobile device. And WordPress has a terrible reputation of, um, of existing with, of being sites, that, well, I should say the WordPress community has a terrible reputation of basically loading up websites with plug-in upon plug-in upon plug-in. Um, so much so, we're actually seeing clients come in with 75 plugins installed on their website. Um, so one of the most common areas of our business is actually picking up new business from people who have slow loading websites that will end up probably stripping back to about 30 plugins that do the same job with some clever thinking. So I know in Mandy's case, not that she was the worst and she did not have 75 plugins, but the number was up there. So finding that balance, I think, is really important if you're in the WordPress space. Maintenance costs... Um, when I, went to, when I went to university, I was a Griffith University boy, so um, back in the day, they used to say, and I assume the numbers are pretty similar, that 68% of the cost in terms of running a digital project is in maintenance. It seems like everybody's forgotten that these days. So if you're going to go and spend $10,000 on a website, then you need to be counting, um, you know, accounting for the fact that to be competitive you need to be spending and updating and you need to be paying for hosting and you need to be evaluating on a regular basis. So I think if you're a long-term player and the money is there um, and your business case supports it, then maintenance is something you need to be considering really upfront. So as a WordPress builder, uh, our advice to you, keep the plugins to a minimal. Um, one of the things we see, um, bizarrely, is the development community, community um, in general, like everyone knows what an include is, right? Where basically you include something on one page, 
that you don't use on another. It seems like they've completely forgotten this when it comes to WordPress. So you can actually include on each particular page you use in WordPress only the plugins you need to make your site run faster. Super simple, fundamental, hardly anybody does it. So if you're upskilling at home and you're trying to pick up some new tool, um, pick up some new tricks, make sure you're looking at that kind of stuff. Backing up your site, um, it's, so, it's so strange. Like So many of our new clients come to us with no backup strategy. So generally what we do is we have uh, nightly backups storing between five to seven retentions um, incrementally. Um, with the e-commerce clients where the data in the database is changing, sometimes it's even more. But even for static brochure sites, we always spend time on a backup strategy with our clients. Um, it may be annoying to spend um, an extra 20 bucks on a server to back up your site per month, but for us to recover the whole thing when you wipe over a file or completely destroy things, it, the cost is exponential and nobody wants to do it. WordPress has its limitations like every any project um, and it's extremely powerful. Where I think um, one of the big focus areas, and I know we've just sat through the, the futuristic uh, talk, is that I think what, what we call internally um, a WordPress hybrid project is where we're going to see a lot of it come. Um, the WordPress community has a lot of plugins that you can build from scratch, and the codex allows for it. It's very easy. Sorry. <clears throat> Apparently time's up. Um, but I think knowing when to actually use WordPress and when to actually use languages like PHP and so forth and RESTful APIs in unison um, is a really good skill to have. I think picking your battles um, in terms of the code structure that you use um, is when you can really make the most of WordPress, and um, that would be my advice to you. Okay. <laughs>